walks in a little bit late, they're going to miss all, all the really, really good stuff. Like me telling you that uh, the washrooms are just outside the door. There's an exit. You might have come in a door over that way, and then there's an exit way far in the back, uh, the, other, the other end of the library, too, in just in case something happens that we need to, uh, we need to vacate unexpectedly. So welcome here. My name's Ernie Epp. I, um, my career has been municipal administration. I, I worked as a chief administrative officer uh, for many years. Started my career in 1985. Uh, my last year working as a CAO was 2014 uh, in, in Morden. I was a city manager in Morden. That was my last real job. I, uh, in my career, I worked for eight, eight different municipalities uh, over that span. Um, started a consulting business just shortly before retirement that uh, was going to be a little bit of, hey, maybe that's something I can, you know, a friend of mine and I can do after we retire just to fill some time so we're not bored. And it took off and I actually retired a little bit earlier than I had expected and uh, I, I love what I do. I really enjoy doing these types of things and sharing in some information. So that's why the city uh, has asked me here. Uh, in the 11 years that we've been doing consulting, uh, my par business partner's name is Dale uh, Lyle. He and I have done work for uh, about 120 of the 137 municipalities in Manitoba, and I know I've done work for over 100 of them already. So, so it's neat to see how other places operate and and uh, and do their things. So, uh, I will let you know that none of none of this. I do tell a few stories uh, or scenarios of things that have happened in the past. None of those are about Winkler. I make sure that I don't tell stories about the place I'm presenting. So last night I in Altona, I told all the Winkler stories. So tonight I'm telling all the Altona No, I'm not. Um, the, uh, there is a small amount of information that I have in here that uh, I will credit to an individual na by the name of George Cuff. He, uh, I tried to reword because I, it's, he thinks he and I think a lot the the same in a, a number of areas. He wrote a book, though, long before I have, because I haven't read, written one yet, and uh, I just can't figure out a better way to say what he said. So there's a couple of slides that, uh, that are, are his words, not mine. So there's a number of, uh, of topics that I want to cover today, um, and I won't go through and say what they all are, but uh, I'm going to share. Uh, my presentation is about an hour and 35 minutes without any, any uh, questions asked. I will say, though, that you are very welcome to ask a question if there's something that I've, I've mentioned that you uh, would like to uh, understand a little bit more about. What I, what I present today is, is a fairly brief snapshot of things. Uh, I, do, I do full day orientations for elected councils, um, and so this is a very, very condensed, and, uh, and not everything very, very is covered today that I would normally in cover. Not so today uh, that I would normally question, cover. Competition. <laughs> oh, it's it's uh, repeating or something like that. Um, if if you do ask a question, and I'm going to be addressing it very soon in another slide, in an upcoming slide, then I'll ask if you wouldn't mind just hanging on to that thought, and uh, we'll cover it when I get there. Okay. I'll try to make room for uh, some question time at the end too. So there's some terminology that I would like to share for, for uh, individuals who may not be familiar with legislation and municipalities and, and uh, um, a few things that I just want to ensure that you recognize because I, I use these words quite regularly during the presentation. So the first one is the word act. Uh, and an act is a piece of legislation or a law that is adopted by the province of Manitoba. It's adopted by the legislature in Winnipeg. A bylaw is also legislation, and that is, is legislation that's passed by a municipality. Uh, it requires three readings, uh, three separate readings in order to be adopted, so councils have to vote on it three times in order for it to become law. In camera is a term that's used when a meeting is held behind closed doors where the public isn't, uh, isn't permitted and, uh, and any discussion that takes place behind those doors can't be disclosed to the public afterwards unless uh, council as a group decides that they're going to now make it public. And I'll share a little bit more about what that means uh, a little later. Uh, member is a person that's either elected or appointed to council. Sometimes uh, in some places there aren't even enough people to run for all of the seats. And so uh, that happened in Stanley a couple of elections ago where they had to then, you know, six got, elect got acclaimed or elected and uh, they had to actually appoint, th those six people had to appoint the seventh person to be a council member. 
A municipality can be a city, a town, or a rural municipality. In this case, we're talking about the city of Winkler. And a resolution is a motion that's made by, at a council meeting that's voted on by council. So it would be Councillor A would, I move that we uh, give ourselves a $100 raise per month. And uh, Councillor B would go, I second that, and they'd have some discussion, and then, and then it would get defeated because they're all penny pinchers and they don't want to spend any more of your tax dollars than they should, right? So first of all, let's find out who can run for council. In order to be eligible to run in the election, a person must first be a Canadian citizen, must be at least 18 years of age on election day, that's on October 26th, and must be a voter in the municipality or in the city. Uh, and a voter is either a resident, a person who's, or an, uh, someone who, is, who owns property in the municipality, in the city and has done so for a minimum of six months as of election day. So basically, uh, if someone either moved to Winkler or purchased property in Winkler April 27th, they're not eligible to run in this election. You had to have been here or owned the property by April 26th. If you own a business and uh, live in the RM of Stanley and you own a business that owns land in the city of Winkler, that does not make you a voter. The business is the landowner, not you, and so uh, businesses don't get to vote, so therefore there's no voter for that piece of property. For any of you that, that now recognize that you're ineligible, I hope that you're still willing to st stay and, uh, and listen to the presentation. So there are a couple of bylaws that, that uh, the city has had to pass in the last uh, uh, while that uh, are specific to the election process. The province has legislated an election financing bylaw, um, and it's, it's regarding finances for candidates for municipal election. In order for a person who wants to run for either mayor or councillor uh, to spend money campaigning, they first have to register with the senior election official. Um, for the mayor, that opened up May 30, uh, May, May 1st, and for a uh, councillor, Registration can only start June 30th, but that's coming up fairly soon. Um, the, I expect the city has a, an information package outlining requirements like this, and a copy of that bylaw will certainly be provided uh, to anybody who's looking at running or, or registered. Um, there are limitations on how much you can spend. Uh, you can only spend $1,000 of your own money. Uh, after that, you have to get donations from other people if you want to spend more. And this bylaw will outline the maximum amount of dollars that you can spend in any, in any event. Uh, the, uh, the, the province states that, uh, that you can, um, that the city or municipalities can set it up to reimburse people for money that they spend. I'm not aware of any, any municipality that has done that, and I would expect the city of Winkler probably doesn't do that either. So any dollars you spend is your own nickel. Every year, it's uh, 1500 yeah. Sorry, it's 1500 and it's, it's 1000 for wards, pardon me. Yeah, $1,500 of your own money. Thanks. So yes? Uh, so can you <coughs> do something like that or will it run the campaign through the mayor or like the mayor or Christian Barnett or something like that? Like can you just do something like that and have those things like that? So, if there's individuals that are volunteering their time, that, that there is not a cost for that. I'd be careful, though, if it's someone who does that for a living, okay. that's going to donate that okay. to you, that's really an in-kind in donation, and that needs to be recognized in your financial, uh, that, that would be my, my take on it. I'd be careful with that. I mean, the last thing you want to happen is somebody gets elected and someone goes, yeah, you know what? You've overspent and now you lose your seat. So, yeah. Yeah, good question. The other bylaw, which, is, uh, which has had to, be, had to be passed, and this had to be passed by a April 26th of this year, so this is brand new, is the use of municipal resources bylaw. It's a new requirement, and again, it's the province that required all municipalities to have this in place. The purpose of this bylaw uh, is mainly to ensure uh, that anybody running, but really it, it foc 
focus is, I would say, more so on, on existing members of council who are seeking re-election that they don't use municipal resources for personal gain of getting re-elected. Uh, it applies during the 42 days from the day nominations open, which is September 14th, until October 26th, election day. Uh, and a copy of this bylaw is also available with, from the city, uh, city office. It may even be on their website. I'm sorry, I didn't look. So what this, what this means is, for example, is uh, the city of, city of Winkler has a newsletter that they put out. And between the start of nominations and election day, I would be extremely surprised if there was any, any comments in the newsletter from any existing member of council who's seeking re-election because that could be seen as, hey, I got my name in a document that's been sent out to all the houses in, in, uh, in Winkler just before the election. That would be considered a misuse of municipal resources. So that's the purpose of that bylaw. So let's talk about Winkler. Winkler is not a small place, we all know that, but it's maybe bigger than you even think. Uh, it became a place back in 1892 when it was first recognized as a, as a community and uh, became a municipality in 1906, probably started as a village and then became a town and, uh, and uh, became a city somewhere around 2000, and in the 2000s anyway, because I know I was in Morden at the time when it happened. Current population is, uh, according to Census Canada, is 13,745, it'll be more now. The assessment role, and this is the value of all property within the city of Winkler, based on information about um, three or four years old now, and in the assessment branch typically is conservative, so the city of Winkler value of property within its boundaries, I'm sure now, is over $2 billion. That's a lot. Winkler has a budget of just over $24.5 million, that includes their uh, water and sewer utility. And on their books they have assets uh, that are the depreciated value of which is just over $118 million. They have full 85 full-time employees and numerous part-time and depending on the season it'll be higher or lower uh, for part-time. So for anybody that's looking at running, there's a significant amount of responsibility there. Decisions that council makes at the table can have an impact on that $1.914 billion of value of property. If they started, if council started making decisions that were negative to the community, people w might start selling their houses, the value of those properties would depreciate, would go down. So that's the responsibility that someone on council has, is those numbers. I want to spend a little time looking specifically at legislation. Uh, the Municipal Act is the, uh, first of all, authorizes the existence of municipalities. If the province of Manitoba didn't have legislation in place to state that these municipalities exist, you wouldn't exist. It's that simple. If, in, in, uh, if the province at some point decided in their infinite wisdom they wanted to get rid of municipalities, they could. Some of you might uh, remember the, the uh, amalgamations that took place uh, January 1st, 2015. You know, Rhineland, Plum, Plum Coulee, and Gretna had to amalgamate because Plum Coulee and Gretna were too small. That's because the province passed, passed uh, legislation that said any, any municipality under 1,000 is amalgamating with another one, period. Had to do it. That's not, not the, the municipality's choice. So. So the city of Winkler, like all the other 136 municipalities in Manitoba, are governed by provincial legislation, and there's, there's a requirement for, mu for all municipalities to comply with what that legislation is. In the Municipal Act, there's a lot of things. Council can, can only do what it is authorized to do by legislation. Most of that authority comes from the Municipal Act, but there's other acts that also apply, and I'm gonna share a few of those. The Municipal Act has an area called spheres of jurisdiction and it outlines a whole bunch of things that municipalities can do. In some cases it's simply if you want to do it, you can. In other cases it's if you want to do this, here's the process you have to follow and go through in order to get to the point where you can then do it. So the province outlines things depending on, uh, on what they see as, as the need of ensuring you know, the public has an idea of what's being done, the public has an opportunity to speak to things, etc. Um, 
and, and, and the Act has some very specific requirements that ensure that the municipality operates in a very open fashion, so information is open to the public, with the exception of the in-camera thing, uh, in-camera, which I uh, will talk a little bit more about yet. So candidates uh, that are not currently on council, I would suggest, have, have the ability to, to see and have access to pretty well the same amount of information that members of council have. Uh, there's certainly exceptions, like anything personnel related, that's personal information and you're not gonna see those things, but the, day, you know, the, the things that go across a council, council mem uh, council's table uh, for regular council meetings, that stuff's basically open to the public. So, so I mean, you can look at their minutes, you can uh, probably go in and ask for information and see what's going on. Um, you know, and, and, the, and one example of that was the first time that we bought in, in Morden that, that we bought a, a, a police vehicle that was a truck. The retired farmers that went to the coffee shop in Morden, start, the first thing they started talking about was, holy mackerel, how expensive, like, you know, like, guys, we know how much trucks cost. This must have cost a fortune, blah, blah, blah. And one of the guys that's sitting there goes, I don't know, I'm going to go find out. So he goes to the, to the police chief and he says, Brad, how much did that, did that truck cost you? Brad goes, just a second. Opens his drawer, pulls out the invoice, goes and makes a photocopy of it and says, here, take this to the coffee shop. Municipalities get fleet discounts and, you know, and so it was way less than what they, they, had, they were talking about. Hey, it, it, we got the right information out, so it was good. So I, I mentioned about in camera and, and there are some there are only a, a limited number of things that, that councils can go in camera for. Uh, so closing the doors and not allowing the public to, to have an idea of what they're talking about has some real limitations to it. Certainly personnel related matters, legal matters, if, if the city is getting sued, you know, that's the type of thing that you're not gonna have a conversation about in public. If, uh, uh, if, it's, if there's negotiations going on with somebody, until those negotiations are done and there's an agreement, those types of conversations are gonna be in camera. Uh, those types of things are, are, are what really goes behind closed doors and, and, and they're not a significant number. So what's the role of council? Uh, and this includes the head of council, the mayor. The role of council, and this is right from the Municipal Act, the role of council is to develop and evaluate the policies and programs of the municipality. That's the first thing. So it's council's responsibility to, to have a conversations and talk about what services do we want to provide? How do we want to provide them? Do we want to charge a fee for them? Do we uh, provide those services to everybody? Are there other things that we, we think would be good for the community that we would like to see done in the community? Do we want to support organizations who are willing to do things on behalf of the city? Uh, all those types of things, programs and, and, uh, and policies, that's council's area of, of jurisdiction. That's what their role is. Secondly then, their responsibility is to ensure that the powers, duties, and functions of the municipality are properly carried out. So they decide this is what the city is going to do, and then their responsibility is to oversee and ensure that the staff are looking after that and doing it the way that they expect it to be done. Thirdly, to carry out the powers, duties, and functions expressly given to the council by legislation. And there's, there's a number of those things. I'm, I won't uh, uh, try to list them all today. Really, this all comes down to a word of, uh, that, that's governance. And I'm gonna talk governance a fair amount yet tonight. That's the first uh, time you, you hear that word. So the role of the head of council, the mayor, uh, the mayor has a few added responsibilities um, beyond all those duties of a council member. The mayor chairs the council meetings. One of the really challenging things for an individual who becomes mayor is that they're expected to provide leadership. The, uh, the reason I say that there's a challenge to that is because the mayor, according to the Municipal Act, doesn't really have other powers other than this list. So there might be other duties assigned by council or in legislation, but they're few and far between. So you have an individual who gets to gets one of seven votes, so has about 14.285% of the vote and is expected to provide leadership to that group. Some people are very gifted and that's a natural thing to be able to do that. For others, that's a real challenge. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But
when I talk other duties assigned by council or in legislation, an example of what other duties might be uh, would be to serve as council's media spokesperson. So if the media wants to at, talk to a member of council about you know this decision or that decision that was made at the council meeting, quite regularly it's the mayor or the head of council that's the spokesperson for council, or at least the first one that they go to uh, with regards to those things. It could be that the mayor says, you know, it would probably be better if uh, this other person spoke on this, on this topic. Role of chief administrative officer. Uh, the municipal act gets a lot longer when it starts talking about this because there's added, there's a lot more responsibilities uh, because it's a full-time day job. Uh, the CAO uh, or city manager, whatever the, the person's uh, the position is called, is the administrative head of the municipality, responsible and for ensuring that the policies and are carried out. So council passes the policies. City manager is responsible for making sure that those things are carried out. Responsible for informing council on the uh, operations and affairs. So how does council ensure that things are working the way that they're supposed to? Some is by observation, but some is also by getting regular reporting from the staff to say, hey, those policies and programs that you've wanted to have done, they're working well. This one, maybe we should talk, because not so much. Let's have a conversation about this. We see some issues with it. CAO is also responsible for the employees of the municipality unless council otherwise determines, is the bookkeeper and minute keeper, and can delegate any of those duties unless council says, nope, that one, we want just you to be doing that thing, but otherwise can delegate. And that's why there's 85 employees, because there's more than one person can look after. So, in essence, the CAO is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations and ensuring that things get done as council uh, has directed. One of the more significant misconceptions, I think, is that uh, once somebody becomes a member of council, uh, you know, the person then thinks, hey, I get to tell all the employees what to do. I get to tell that guy that's been doing that lousy job of snow clearing. I finally get to go and tell him how to do it right. No, you don't. You ever had uh, two bosses or three or four? Never fun. You need one boss. And so the CAO has one boss, that's all of council, and that person who's doing the snow clearing is gonna have somebody as another employee in the organization that's also, uh, also uh, supervises him. So if, you're, if you were hoping that you'd be able to tell all those 85 full-time and some of those part-time or seasonal employees what to do on a regular basis, you might have to wait till the CAO job opens up because that's really where that gets to happen. So that's the Municipal Act very, in a nutshell. Municipal Assessment Act, talked before about the almost one point, or almost $2 billion in, in value. Uh, the, this act provides the authority for assessing property for the purpose of taxation. And most of us probably know that if you have a lower valued property, you're going to pay less taxes than if you have a higher valued property. The province uh, provides this service to all the municipalities in Manitoba, with the exception of the city of Winnipeg who have their own and uh, they send an annual bill to uh, every municipality for doing that work. We, as property owners, get a notice saying, here's what your, your value is, and if you don't agree with it, if you think it's too low or too high, then uh, you can appeal that to what's called a Board of Revision, and they will hear your appeal, and, and your, uh, your property value might get adjusted. And I say too low or too high, I always used to say just, if, you know, if, if people think it's too high, they can appeal it. But I, I am aware of at least one example where someone appealed their assessment because they, they felt it was too low. They want us, wanted to sell their property, they wanted to make sure that even in the assessment role, the value was high enough so you get more money for it. They paid more taxes until they sold it, but hopefully they got what they wanted. Planning Act is a pretty key um, piece of legislation for municipalities because it outlines uh, how municipalities address development. Uh, the overriding document that's used locally is called the development plan. Uh, it's adopted by the planning district. Here we have MSTW planning district, and so they've adopted the development plan on behalf of all the member municipalities. And the development plan lays the foundation for development. It doesn't get into details. It, it sort of goes, okay, let's, let's do a map of Winkler. Here's area for future growth, and we think that's a good area for residential. Here's an area that we think would be commercial. And, and, and here, we, we need to have some future park area. But it doesn't get into any specifics. It talks about policies where, you know, any development that we, uh, we 
entertain, will be, will be uh, uh, done in a sustainable way. Those types are the, that's the wording you're going to see in a development plan. Then when you get to a zoning bylaw, which is adopted by the, the, the municipality, so the city of Winkler has a zoning bylaw, that's where you get into specifics and you go, this residential growth area, some of that's going to be multi-residential right here. The rest of it is single residential with the exception of some, some duplex area here or there or whatever. And it will have that you have to be at least 20 or 25 feet from the front property line and five feet from the side property line. And you can't, for a house, you can't be more than three stories high or, or maybe 30 feet or whatever, whatever's in there. But all those details are in the zoning bylaw. Um, any proposed subdivisions that come along have to be approved by city council in order for them to be uh, to, to take place, to, to uh, get the authorization they need to go ahead. The province also has a say in that, but without the city saying yes, without city council saying yes, the subdivision doesn't happen. Um, and then council here is also the decision-making authority. If, if uh, you look at your, the zoning bylaw and you go, boy, that affects me negatively because you know, I got, I got a really restricted yard and I'd like to put an addition, you know, have a, have a screened in room on the front of my house because I don't have room in the back. And I'm already too close, you know, I'm gonna be too close to the, to the street. I have to be 25 feet, but I'd like to build it so it's at least six or seven feet deep. So I'd like to be only 22 feet. You can apply for a variation. Council will hear the, hear the application and may approve it or may not depending on uh, the, on who comes and, and speaks and what, I what issues there might be or might not be with regards to that application. So those are the types of things, one of the types of things that uh, councils have to do and deal with. I want to share a little bit about the Municipal Council Conflict of Interest Act. So the whole intent of this, of this legislation, uh, which the province passed, is they want to help ensure that anybody that's sitting at the council table is not sitting there and making decisions that are going to specifically add more money to their own pocketbook. So there's guidelines, there's requirements. So members have to disclose their assets and interests each year by the end of November. Uh, it doesn't have to state the actual dollar amount, but this information is available for public inspection. Uh, I have very infrequently have heard that people actually have gone and looked, but it's usually when they think, hey, somebody's gone and, and put money in their pocket they should, on, on their own. They were involved in the decision to put money in their pocket. Um, that disclosure of interests includes, um, includes who your employer is. It includes if you own a business, you have to put that down. It includes every piece of property you own in Manitoba other than your principal residence. It includes if you have, uh, if you own stocks in a business, it includes if you own mutual funds outside of RSPs. Because you might own enough mutual funds that has uh, Canadian tire stocks that it might put you over the, the limit. Uh, and so when there's a bill paid by the city of Winkler to Canadian tire, it could put you in a conflict of interest because technically you're putting money in your pocket because Canadian tire is gonna make a profit and you own stocks. So th this also applies to anyone who is living under the same roof as you, who is a dependent. And so even if you are a part-time employee at Canadian Lumber and you make $15,000 a year working part-time and your spouse happens to be a physician is making $600,000 a year, your spouse is a dependent according to this legislation. So everything that I said about what you have to mark down, your, spou your spouse's information also has to be on that statement of assets and interests. doesn't have to state the dollar amount though, but it does have to state those things. <clears throat> so whenever there's an issue to be discussed at council where, um, or at a committee meeting where, where a member or a dependent of the member could be in a conflict of interest or may gain, basically may gain financially, that member has to declare a potential conflict of interest and remove themselves from not only the discussion uh, about that issue, but also the decision about that issue and, and is not to talk to any other members of council about it at any, at any time. So Winkler's of relatively large size and, and it's maybe a little easier not to, for those things not to um, become an issue so much, but in smaller communities, 
for sure it, it can be a challenge. And I know one municipality that's pretty small. It has one contractor locally that owns heavy equipment. The next closest one is about 40 miles away. Well, when they need to get some work done because there's a water break, they need to talk. They need to get the local person because they need to get this dealt with. So they've got policies in place and and lots of wording set out to ensure that that council member is never in a conflict of interest when it comes to using his services or his business's services for the municipality. There's ways where I mean you shouldn't. It shouldn't be owning a business shouldn't exclude you from being able to you know, put in bids to the, to the municipality that you happen to be a council member on. It gets a little tricky, but you just got to stay away and make sure that you're not involved at all in the discussion or the decision should your, um, your bid be one that's accepted. And if you happen to be in a, that part-time employee of Canadian Lumber and there's a, there's a bill that's being paid to Canadian Lumber, even though you're just a part-time employee and making $15,000, you should not be involved in the vote to approve that, that check payment to Canadian Lumber because, in theory, you're paying Canadian Lumber to make a profit to ensure that you can still work $15,000 of part-time. Fun, huh? I don't make the rules, just sharing them. All right. So let's talk a little bit about a uh, topic that, uh, that's becoming more and more front and center the, uh, in the past while, and that's respect, respect, period. Um, respect for elected officials, I'm going to start with that. So it's, it's really important to treat everyone respectfully, even if you don't respect them. I will tell you that in my career, there were some council members where I learned pretty quickly they were not in it for the right reasons. They weren't in it for the benefit of, their, of the community that they were serving. They were in it for, their, for their themselves. There were some things they wanted to, for their own benefit, and I struggle with you know, respecting pe people that are in it, in it for those reasons. But I still had an obligation to treat them respectfully. There's, there's uh, times when you know, you're going to be sitting at the table and people are going to disagree with you at a council table, still have to treat them respectfully even if you don't respect their view or their position. And when you're speaking contrary to indiv an individual, you need to speak respectfully with regards to being contrary to that individual too. There's a great saying that uh, I, I read it somewhere and I, I have it. I don't put it up on the screen because I, I don't want people to necessarily take a picture of it and go, oh, that's what Ernie said. But here, here goes. I, it, this one's being recorded. It's happening anyway. So all it, what it said, said was all elected officials are worthy of being treated respectfully, even the ones dumb enough to disagree with you. So during a four-year period, I don't know, um, there's lots of decisions that are going to happen uh, that council's going to make where all seven are going to vote the same. You know, pretty straightforward issue. They all, vote, they all vote the same. But there are always issues where not everybody agrees. And that's very, very healthy. It should be that way. Winkler, like all municipalities, is a diverse community. That diversity needs to be represented, represented at the council table too. So there's going to be some issues that come up, and and you know one person's view may be very far, far this way, another person's view may be very far that way. What's important is to ensure that you treat each other respectfully with those diversities of, of views. Hey. I appreciate what your, your view that you may think that this is the necessary thing to do. I want to share with you my thoughts and why I think it's important that we go this other direction. And during that four-year period, there are times you're going to lose. You're going to be part of the minority of people that vote one way or the other and not get the way you want. It will happen. And it might be yourself. It might be two of seven. It might be three of seven but you're going to be, it's going to go the other direction of what you want. It will. So my comment to you, and here's where I'm very, very blunt, is that if you can't handle being disagreed with or being in a minority when it comes to a vote, or if you're the type of individual, type of individual that has to have things your way all the time, then don't run. 
because for the next four years, all, of, all that will happen is it will create a whole bunch of tension in the room. It will create a whole bunch of disruption. It will result in employees probably leaving. It will result in a great deal of frustration. Anybody that gets on council has to be able to suck it up when they lose and go on to the next item and keep going. And there's no point in alienating those that, that didn't vote your way because there's going to be another time when the vote's going to happen where you're going to need some of those people to vote with you in order for that to go your way. And if you alienate them, eventually they're going to start voting opposite to you just because that's the type of person you are. So you have to recognize not, it's not always going to go your way. That's what we call democracy. And I kind of like it compared to dictatorship. Yeah, I think it's a lot better. Excuse me. Quick story about that. So there was a council um, many years ago already where there was two individuals on council that didn't get along. And they didn't get along to the point where they actually had a fist fight in council meeting, in council chamber. And that led to the two of them got restraining orders against each other for the balance of the of the four-year term. They had to sit as far apart as they could at the council, t council table. And after the meeting was over, they had to go opposite directions so that they didn't get any closer to each other. That's the closest they could be at any given time was when they were sitting at the table. Do you think that made for a really healthy, you know, beneficial, let's do things for the municipality kind of conversation place? I don't think so. It was not good. So try to stay away from that. <laughs> all right, respect for staff. Staff are uh, very key to the team. They are a part of it by all means. And uh, I've, I've tried to figure out, figure out a way to share, you know, how do, how do I describe uh, describe this because council is the decision makers. They're in charge. Um, but the staff are really important to, to seeing those things that council decides happening. So uh, I'm going to say that, that staff are, are part of the municipal family. Think of it like um, council are the parents and staff are the children. And, and so, you know, when your child does something wrong, you know, is demoralizing them publicly the way to deal with that? Staff are going to screw up. They're going to make mistakes. But chastising them in an open council meeting is probably not the best way to deal with it. You know, like if they need to be told, yeah, tell them behind closed doors. Um, not at the council meeting. That's not the place to do it. Hi. Council has one employee, the CAO, but there's there may be times where council goes, yeah, you know, that's snow, snow, the guy that does the snow clearing, he did a really crappy job. And so in the council meeting, he's like, you know, we really got to do something about this snow clearing system we got because our employees haven't got a hot clue about how to do this work. How do you think those employees are going to feel going forward? Council doesn't care about how I, how I do my job. That's, that's what I mean by that. So what, what may happen, like, and I've seen examples of this, where someone writes and says, I got issues with the snow clearing, and uh, it beca it's a letter, and it comes to the council table, and, and all, the next thing, council starts, starts grumbling about the lousy job our staff do about snow clearing. You know, so that's what I mean by chastising staff. It's like, don't do, you know, you know obviously we have someone who, who is, is frustrated with our snow clearing, so let's, let's let Jody investigate and see what's, what might be going on and provide information to us so we can provide a response. That's rather than, oh yeah, our, we know our snow clearing sucks, but the guy's been here so long, we can't get rid of him, so you know, we're stuck with it till he retires. Not the, the conversation to have at the council table. So that's a couple of slides about respect, and unfortunately some people uh, in Manitoba still don't get it, and so the province has actually legislated respect now. Um, in recent years, there's been increasing I claims of incidents of harassment, of bullying uh, by elected officials to fellow council members and uh, also to staff. So the municipal, municipal Act now requires every municipality to have a code of conduct bylaw in place for members of council. Um, any complaints that, uh, that are submitted, that are filed, 
excuse me, require investigation, which is likely going to be a third party that's going to do that investigation, and those costs become the municipalities. If a breach has taken place, there are now uh, greater um, things that uh, a council can do with regards to an individual, uh, which includes up to suspending an elected official or individual for up to 90 days so that they can't, go to, they can't be a, attend council, council or committee meetings, they don't get paid for that three months, uh, that sort of thing. And this sounds like, well, why, do, why is this necessary? But uh, th it wasn't that many years ago where there was a municipality, and, and all it takes is one member of council, and this is a perfect example. The council of five, one person got elected, and right from day one, he started contacting the CAO, the assistant CAO, and the public works manager. They basically had three management staff, that was it. And he, was, he contacted those three, you know, like a couple of dozen times a day or more with emails, texts, phone calls. You have no idea how to do your job, this is crap, blah, 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 on and on. The operations manager left, the two, the CAO and assistant CAO pleaded with the other four members of council to please do something, and they did not. So they ended up, they, the two, those two ended up suing the municipality for defamation because of what this one individual member of council was doing. That municipality, before they even got to a point where they paid out those two people, they racked up a quarter of a million dollars in expenses. And this is a municipality whose budget is probably in the three million dollar mark. That's huge, and all it took was one person. Now, I don't think there's many people like this individual um, because the individual uh, also had, a, had a, a son who made it to professional hockey, and he sued his son for the costs of putting him through minor hockey. So I'm guessing that there isn't somebody like that in Winkler. <laughs> At least I sure hope not. But <clears throat> it does, it, all it takes is one person at the table, uh, you know, one new person at the table, and it can change the dynamics very, very significantly, and there can be some pretty significant problems. So, you know, before, before you go on, go on uh, doing anything like that, learn what's going on and get an idea of how this all works. And part of that claim had to do with the fact that the rest of council refused to do anything about it. That was the biggest issue. And so if you get elected and there is somebody that gets on council that's maybe a challenging individual, unfortunately you're going to have to deal with that individual and you're going to have to keep them in their place because that becomes part of your job. So I want to share a few insights of, uh, of uh, the things that, that members of council can do to really turn, turn things south for a municipality pretty darn quick. These are my key insights. First one is that uh, somebody gets in and they're elected and they think that the mayor uh, is just like in the movies. You know, the mayor gets to ha gets, has all the power. The mayor gets to decide who, who the employees are. The mayor can basically push the council aside and I'm doing it the way I want to do it. I've seen that in the presidential situation in the States uh, fairly recently where that was kind of what was happening. But the reality is we don't have a strong mayor model in, in Manitoba. There are some states where that's the case. But it, but is, it's not in Manitoba, uh, for sure. So mayor gets one of one seventh of the vote. That's it. So the mayor needs to recognize that in order for me to see things happening and move forward in my agenda that I would like to see happen, has to convince at least three others on council to vote to think the same way and vote uh, to vote in favor of doing those things. Second example is where individual council members start interfering with the running of the municipality outside of council meetings. I've had conversations and calls from both CAOs and from council members who have talked and said, uh, and I'll use the council member term or view, um, two hours after the council meeting's over, they voted in opposition to something that got passed. They said, yeah, I walked in and talked to the CAO, and it was the head of council that, did, that called me about this. I walked in and talked to the CAO, and I said, don't you dare do it, take any action on that decision that council made, because it's wrong. Sorry, CAO doesn't, doesn't report to the, count, the mayor or to any individual member of council. CAO reports to, the, to council a, as a group. And if council says this is the direction we're going, that's the CAO's job is to take that on and do it that way. 
We don't have ward counselors in Winkler, so I won't get into uh, that one. Um, but the, f the fourth one I've point I've got there is that council is confusing managing with governing. So I want to talk about governing. Because really it does all come down to governance. <clears throat> the definition of governance is the act or process of overseeing the control and direction of something. And in this case, we're talking about the city of Winkler. That key word that's in there is overseeing. Uh, there's a phrase that's fairly, fairly well used that that's noses in, fingers out. Councils need to know what's going on. They need to, they need to little be a little nosy and see and make sure that the, what they want to see done is being accomplished the way they want to see it done. But they're not the ones that are grabbing the shovels and digging the holes. They don't get to go on the snow clearing equipment and do the snow clearing. They don't get to stand on the other side of the counter and tell people that, uh, uh, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take your tax payment but can't take it by visa. It's got to be by, by check or, or uh, debit card or cash. You know, that's what staff are there for. Um, governance requires vision. It, it's, it's focusing on the big picture, and, and there's been a lot of that that I've seen happen in Winkler since, uh, since I've moved to Morden, because I pay attention to next door. So governance is likely the biggest issue that, that most municipalities face. Public perception may be that, you know, any single member of council should be able to fix their problem. You know, like, I voted for you. I got this water at the end of my driveway, and I'm sick and tired of it. I want something done about it. You'll get those calls. And because if you get elected, you're new, for sure you're going to get those calls, because they got somebody new they're going to try. Um, but that's not really the case, because a member of council can only have, sorry, that individual member of council solving that problem isn't really the case, because... Uh, they really only have the ability to be one of the seven votes when, when a meeting's taking place. And outside of those meetings, really, there isn't, there isn't authority that's outlined for, for members of council that they have. In meetings, council sets policy, direction. Outside of meetings, administration carries them out. One member of council can't change that decision the next morning just because the guys in the coffee shop think it's wrong. For anybody that gets elected, it's really important that you learn and know what your role is. City of Winkler has, d has, d has multiple lanes. Council's in one lane, staff are in the other lane. Find out what, what you need to do in the lane that's yours and, and what you can't do and what others in the organization are required to do so you understand how the whole thing works. And then it's equally important that once you've got that all figured out and you understand all of those rules and roles, that you live by them and expect and ensure that everyone else does the same. So here's a few examples of governance. Uh, one is, you know, council deals with the organization through one employee, the CAO. That's a form of governance. You know, you got an organizational chart where there's only one employee that reports to council, CAO. Having a good process in place to ensure council gets the information it needs to make good decisions is good governance. So if somebody writes to council and has an issue, it shouldn't be that that letter is the only thing that shows up about that topic. There should be some expectation that there's some background information provided by staff, maybe some analysis. There like, should likely be a recommendation of this is what we administratively think council should, how council should deal with this, and maybe even, even a uh, financial impact of the decision and what it's going to mean going forward dollars-wise. That's good governance. And the reason that that's important is, oh, sorry, I'll save that story for another, for something else a couple slides later. Uh, sorry, it's the next item. Even little things like not deciding on a request by someone who comes and speaks to council as a delegation at the same meeting and allowing staff to do some homework and get some background information before council makes the decision is, is I think, is good governance. Here's the example. Ernie Epp comes to the city of Winkler Council and goes, hey, I got this great idea for, you know, some art stuff for the city of Winkler. And there's a federal grant that I can apply for, but I need some seed money to make it happen. So I'd like to, I'd like to request $5,000, and it's $100,000 that I can get from the feds. But I need the money today because grant deadline's in a couple of days. One of the first questions that you might ask is, so Ernie, how long have you known about this federal grant? I've known about it for about three months, been working on it the whole time. And you waited till D-Day to come and ask us for money? 
in any event, you know, you're, you're, you, you kind of like this Ernie guy, so it's like, well, let's give him the money. So you give him the $5,000. Or maybe you don't, and you go, hey, at governance, we should maybe see if there's some background information. So you ask staff to look into it. Sorry, Ernie, we're gonna, we can't make the decision until next meeting. And lo and behold, the next meeting, staff come back and say, it's really interesting, you know? This Ernie Epp guy came as a delegation 17 years ago, and he asked for $5,000 for something exactly like this. We gave it to him, never saw him again, till now. It's not bad sometimes to get the history on what's going on, what's happened in the past, before uh, you just deal with the delegation that's in front of you. And there will be times when those delegations, they're so compelling, they tell such a great story that you're like, yeah, we want to do what they're asking, because this will be good for Winkler. But it might not be. There's nothing wrong with waiting two weeks. Council and administration have very different roles. Um, I've already mentioned the need to work together as a team and really needing to learn and understand those roles that each is expected to provide and then remain in those roles. Otherwise, there's going to be issues. A mayor once described an the, the municipality as, as a team where every member of the team, whether they are the greater operator or the CAO or the mayor or any of the others, is a spoke on a wheel, on a bicycle wheel. Well, you know, one of those spokes breaks, eventually that whole wheel falls apart. You know, so I like that analogy where, you know, no spoke is more or less important than the others. If you get elected, find out how your municipality operates, because there is flexibility in the Municipal Act, and the City of Winkler operates differently than the City of Morden, that's differently than the, than the RM of Stanley, that's different than others, in some ways. So, how does this one operate? And learn that because there's times that I've seen people get elected and the reason they get elected is because the CAO said no to them once and I, I'm going to get that guy back or I'm going to get that, that woman back. They get elected and they go, let's get rid of the CAO. And, and later they find out, A, it costs a bunch of money, but secondly and maybe more importantly, the CAO was only doing what council's policies and programs were. CAO said no because their boss said that's the, what the, the answer has to be. I had a phone call once about, uh, it was about 11 a.m., and it was a head of council that called me and said, um, hi, uh, you're, this is Ernie Up. Yeah. Well, this is so-and-so from the municipality of. Just wondering, you know, I, uh, today's Friday. We're wondering, would you be available to be an interim CAO on, like, starting Monday? Why? What's going on? Ah, uh, we have a meeting at 1 o'clock. We're firing our CAO. Let's just, can we talk? <laughs> You know, and so so I actually drove there, and we had a conversation, and it turned out that you know it was exactly like I described. It wasn't that the CAO was do wanting to upset people or annoy them. The CAO was providing this is what council says how we how we operate. So then this new council went, oh, so we can change these things? Yeah, there are things that you can change. So they did kept on going, it worked. Council's leadership role, uh, I mean, I talked before about the, the head of council needing to be, you know, needs to provide leadership according to the Municipal Act. In my opinion, all of council needs to provide leadership, and, and my description of leadership or definition is that it's the art of motivating a group of people to act towards achieving a common goal. So, mayor has six others around the table, somehow, in providing leadership, that mayor has to has to work with those other six to come up with what are the things that collectively we can agree on that we want to see accomplished during this four-year term. Because whether it's positive or negative, every council leaves a legacy. And if I'm on council, I would much rather that that legacy that I'm a part of be a positive one, be something that people look back and go, yeah, that council did this. And you can look at a lot of things in Winkler that have happened. I mean, this library is a great example. You know, that's a legacy from a few councils ago. Your, the parks in, in Winkler have, have, have 
have been Im improved on so much in the last 20 years that I've lived in the area. There's lots of great things that have happened in Maple. And then once you've got council as a group are focused and going in, in one direction, now they've got to bring those employees on stream and get them thinking the same way. And then it's working to get the community to go, yes, this is what we, we all, you know, this is what we see and what we would like to see done. So it's, it's also creating a way for people to contribute to making something extraordinary happen. You know, getting to a point where, as council, you've figured it out to the point where people go, I really like what you're doing. How can I help to make that happen? I want to be a part of this. And then it's dealing with people by communicating, enabling, equipping, defining morals, having solid character, and being ethical. Technical, you know, for anybody that works with machinery, machinery, this machine breaks down, you take it apart, you figure out which part's broken, you pull it out, replace it with a new part that's on back order, and you've got to wait a while, but eventually it gets here, and you fix it, and the machine works again. But when you're on council, you're not dealing with machines. You are dealing with people, whether they're employees or public or the other individuals sitting at the table. It's people. People, dealing with people is leadership, and that's way harder than the technical stuff. But that's the job you sign up for when you become a counselor. And it's not a bad thing, it's a great thing. I think what's valuable for individuals that do get elected is to recognize that you may not have the experience or the knowledge necessary to fulfill that role right from the start. I've seen lots of new council members that they feel like they're deer in the headlights for six months, sometimes even a year. And most council members would tell you that that's, that's how they felt. Even, you know, some of them show it really, really well. <laughs> Others hide it kind of well. But it's, there's a lot to learn, a lot to learn. So orientations are really important, and I know that that's one of the things that the city of Winkler does, and it's necessary. Leaders, leaders create legacies. They look for changes that are going to be positive for the municipality. I bet you at one time the roads in Winkler were gravel and weren't paved. And then somebody came along and said, hey, seen this new stuff called asphalt. Pretty cool. Maybe we should look at that. And then eventually curbs and gutters came along and the, all kinds of improvements. And so that's what leadership is, is how do we make our place better? It's, it's exercised by those who understand the principle of accountability. It's like, we can't be wor worrying about the little details of day to day. We need to be looking at what can we make do today that's going to matter and make a difference to this community in 15 years. And sometimes those things take 15 years to blossom. But that's the type of stuff that councils do. Quality leadership requires a, a few things, and this is the George Cuff wording. It requires the ability to clearly discern issues and principles at stake. It requires a willingness to take a personal stand based on what is morally right. It's understanding of what would appear to constitute the public will. So someone comes as a delegation, and they got 17 people behind them, you know, and the person speaks and is really, really powerful, and it's like, Wow, like this must be what the community wants. That's only 18 people. You've got 13,750 others out there that you're also representing at the same time. Is that the public will or isn't it? It might be. It might not be. The challenge for you is to figure out whether it is or not. The strength to resist the naysayers of the issue based on a defensible position. <clears throat> so I know of a place where um, they were having some real challenges with their volunteer fire, uh, fire chief wasn't responding to emails or phone calls, wasn't submitting reports, you know, it was just sort of was doing his own thing. So council, you know, it's like, well, it's a volunteer, and so they actually reached out to a couple of people uh, and said, you know, we're thinking about dismissing our fire chief, volunteer fire chief, and, uh, and you know, getting somebody else. What do you, you know, what do you think? And that's a tough one, you know, like you, you better make sure that that's the, that's the decision you want to do and that's the right thing to before you do it. So they did it. And the whole fire department said, if he goes, we're all resigning. And they reinstated the fire chief within a couple of days. Was that the right thing to do? If it was, you got to take that stand, and it might hurt. But then if that's the right thing, then that's the thing you need to do. You need to be able to defend that position. And then the foresight to see the longer-term uh, impacts of the issue 
and thus the willingness to stick with the decision in light of an alternative that would be immediately more acceptable but an unwise choice in the future. Sometimes the decisions that councils have to make may not be popular. Um, we always talked about, hey, if we can get 50% plus one um, in favor of what council's done, then that's a good thing. Uh, and sometimes the decisions councils have to make it isn't even that much. But unfortunately, there are times when those decisions are the, are the, the right alternatives. And in, in time, it will show that way, but it may not look like it right from the start. Role of head of council, elected, uh, mayor's elected as a political leader and as a representative of the people. Everybody gets to vote for him, just like all the council members. Isn't expected to be a municipal administrator or understand that. Needs to be able to understand community issues and concerns though, and to be able to lead council towards a successful resolution of, of the key issues. That's that leadership stuff needs to ensure that the information that the mayor gets and hears about becomes, um, because of his, of his or her office is shared with all members of council. Also, um, I mean, the mayor doesn't get to keep all of that information to him or herself. The other me elected members get to hear those things too. And then the head of council needs to let the CAO do their job, and good ones do. Council members are expected to be the eyes and ears of the public not the administration of the municipality. Council members' power needs to be exercised at council meetings. Pretending to be powerful in and in charge of the day-to-day -day affairs of the administration is both dangerous and corrupt. Council member um, only has the authority to inquire as to the nature of the problem if somebody calls them, and then commit to getting back to that individual. Any further commitment is beyond the powers and authority of that individual member of council. <clears throat> Far too often I've seen situations where people get elected and even they think they know how the, the municipality operates. Someone contacts them about an issue and they promise something to that individual. And then they go to the council meeting and say, hey, I had this phone call and, and this is the issue and, uh, and I'm, I, I'm, I need to get a motion passed that we do this. And council, especially the ones that have been there for a while, go, it's not how we operate, not doing it. But we have to because I promised. Don't promise, because somebody's going to look like a fool if you promise, and you, pro you can't commit to that promise, and it's not going to be the rest of them, it's going to be yourself. So only commit that I'll find out, I'll get back to you. Uh, lots of places, uh, council members are encouraged, and I don't disagree with this, it's like, oh, it's like your issue is a public works issue. Okay, so this is the phone number for public works. Rather than me maybe mis you know, misinterpreting what it is you're really needing, phone there, and then if you're not satisfied at with, with, what, with how things turn out, by all means, call me back and I will, I will delve into this further. Most of the time, those things get resolved without council, the council member having to become involved. for election purposes only. So, you know, there can be six members of council and six wards. You know, I got elected from this part of the municipality, but I don't get to make the decisions that happen in that area by myself. You know, like if there's a variation uh, for planning or a subdivision application, I, I, as the person elected here, don't get to decide that. All seven of us have to, have to you know, It's a, a bit of communication. It's it's um, it's intended that um, once the population gets to be so large, you know, it's better to have an area representation for election purposes. Because if you're campaigning, can you imagine trying to campaign all of Winnipeg? I mean, the mayor's have to, but but you know, as a, as a councillor. So at some point, uh, even urban places start to, and then uh, you know, lo there's lots of this misconception that wards are are intended in rural areas geographical space. Well, they're not. It's based on population. But they kind of think that way and go, hey, well, at least the people here have a neighbor, so to speak, that they can call and say, you know, I elected you and I got an issue and I'd like to have it resolved. Yeah, no worries. Role of administration. 
administration, they are there to support um, uh, support council, but their supporting role has to be stated with clarity and needs to be based on principles that guard their professionalism and their independence. Council is there to set policy. The buck always stops at the council table. Uh, the administration is there to provide advice to council. They will provide it from an administrative perspective. It will not always, in a, no, well, sorry, let me rephrase that. It should not uh, include political perspectives because they are not politicians. Council members are. So they're going to give a, a, an administrative view on an issue, and then council has to consider that as well as the political influences that are out there. And sometimes the recommendation that, that uh, councils get from staff isn't, isn't what they finally decide on. And that's okay, as long as it still complies with the act and it's not immoral or, or illegal. It's all right. Key areas that, that need to be defined though for staff so they know where their limits are, how far they can go, how much they can deal with day to day before something has to come back to council is who gets to hire, discipline, or release employees. That needs to be on paper, needs to be clear. The power to require work to be done in policies and resolutions to be carried out. There needs to be clarity with regards to how that's done. The power to delegate. Clarity is required with regards to that too. All of the stuff needs to be down on paper and clear so that everybody knows their roles and how far they can or cannot go. The power to approve expenditures and to what levels. Most municipal, well, I would say all municipalities have a procurement policy, purchasing policy, and you know, su some support staff will have the authority to spend so and so many dollars and beyond that they have to go to their supervisor who has to go to their supervisor for another dollar amount, who has to go to the CAO for that and a higher dollar amount and as eventually if the dollar amount's too high it comes to council. There's limits. There need to be. They need to be clear. Um, the power to override a council approved budget or reassign monies therein. Most municipalities that doesn't happen. Staff can't go hey, you know, we've almost overspent on this line, but we've saved like $7,000 here, so let's just sort of move $7,000 and we can keep spending on this stuff. Usually that goes to council, goes back to council for council to say, yeah, okay, we're okay with that. The power to appoint people to boards and committees, uh, in my opinion, should always be council that's doing that. That should not be staff. And then the power to change the reporting relationships of departments. So can the CAO, can the city manager, <coughs> decide that, uh, hey, I'm going to shuffle departments around and this person used to report directly to me, but I'm going to have that person now report to someone else that reports to me. Does the city manager have that authority or not? It needs to be clear so that they know. The way that municipalities get into trouble is, is if things aren't clear and staff do things that they think they have authority for and council thinks they don't. And all of a sudden the gray area becomes black and white in you know, differing, differing ends of the spectrum and it causes problems. So be clear. Take the time to be clear. That's good governance. Council has that one employee. It's the CAO. Um, and you need to deal through the CAO for, for uh, everything with regards to the organization. In order for that to happen, though, there needs to be some really good communication back and forth. Council should expect really good information from your city manager. And your city manager needs information from council, too. They need, I mean, you're the eyes and ears. You're the ones that, that get that political influence, influences and staff need to hear that because lots of times staff don't get that because they're not elected and it's important. There needs to be really good communication back and forth to make sure everybody's understanding what's going on here. <coughs> whether it's council or, or whether it's committee, uh, there needs to be respect for the mandate and authority of each other uh, between council and CAO. There needs to be trust and commitments made. And I'm going to quantify or qualify that by saying uh, it's a three-word phrase, trust and confirm. There is nothing wrong with councils from time to time ensuring that staff are doing what you're expecting. That's part of your job. That's the nose is in. It's not the fingers in. Be snoopy once in a while. It's all right. It keeps everybody honest. It helps ensure that your staff um, are doing their job. We had, uh, we had an, when I moved, moved to Morton, we had an employee that worked in the front area, and she, she was a little, you know, she'd been there a long time. She was a little grumpy sometimes, and, and, and council let me know that there was a challenge with regard.
regards to that. So they said, you know, it'd be nice. I mean, she's going to retire in a few years. It's not worth, you know, so let's try and make her a happier employee and, or at least treat people more respectfully, right? So she didn't report to me, so I talked to the person that she did report to, and I said, you know, let's talk about what we could maybe do. <clears throat> well, the idea that we came up with was at the end of every month, we would pick three, he would pick three different days and three different times. The closest receipt to those dates and times, those people would get mailed a quick survey. How were you treated? Did you get what you wanted? You know, that sort of stuff. Three or four questions. That's all it was. And we let staff know we were going to do that. Changed it just like that. Just knowing that there was a potential for the trust and confirm thing, it was like, I'm going to treat people more respectfully because I don't want people coming back, writing back and saying, oh, no, I was treated very poorly because we could tell who who looked after them. So it worked. The confidence in the word for each other, and that's one of those things where trust needs to be developed. And uh, and and uh, there are times where I would, uh, you know, a resident would contact me and say, oh, yeah, I had a conversation with counselor so-and-so, and they said that I could blah, blah, blah. I'm going, how many times do I have to tell these council members that you, they, we don't do that? We can't do that. You know, it took me a while to grow up and learn that it wasn't, council didn't say that stuff. People heard that stuff. And then they would go like, yeah, well, this counselor said so-and-so. The counselor didn't say it. That's what they wanted to hear, so that's what they heard. So it's like, I got to trust the council's not sharing information that's not factual. That happens in reverse, too. Sometimes you're going to hear from the public, oh, yeah, I was told by the office, blah, blah, blah. Maybe not. Find out before you start going like, oh, our employees are anno getting annoying again. Check it out. It could very well be that they heard something other than what was stated. It happens all the time. You ever had that thing where you're at a camp, ca campfire and one whispers to the next person, to the next person, you know, by the sixth or seventh person, the story's way different? That happens. It happens in municipal too. And then the other, th one of the other roles for, for the CAO is a desire to help council achieve its mandate. There will be times that your CAO is going to recommend things that are con and, and you're going to, as council, decide otherwise and not go with the recommendation. And people would talk to me after and go, wow, you know, so Ernie, council didn't take your recommendation. Like, that must be difficult. And I go, it's my job. My job is to do what they wanted, so now I'm going to go do what they want. Shouldn't change whether or not they agreed with, with what I'm thinking because I don't have those political influences. It's that simple. We need to respect each other and recognize that we have different roles. The, the CAO has to implement those decisions just like I talked about of council, even when those decisions don't reflect the advice that was given. The recognition by council of the professionalism of administration and the, its ability to get the job done. A lot of staff have spent a lot of time becoming really good at their job. So don't, don't discount that because th when they provide you contrary uh, recommendations to what you may, might be thinking, it's not because they don't want to agree with you. It's because they want to give you their view from where they sit. Can you imagine if somebody wrote a letter and said, we, we don't want a snowflake to hit the ground and, and it, all the people that got elected said, yeah, like we're, gonna, we're, we're running because we're sick and tired of snow on the streets. So the city manager goes, well, shoot, maybe, maybe I'm going to make a recommendation that's like, let's buy six more graders or snow clearing pieces of equipment so that we can clear, the t clear more Winkler in like two hours or an hour. It's going to cost a whole bunch of money, but that's what council wants, I think. And council goes, well, I mean, we're kind of new at this, so let's rely on our city manager. And okay, let's buy all that stuff and spend all that money. Well, I'm not sure I agree with it because it looks like a lot of money. You've gone and done something that the city manager recommended trying to make you happy, and it's the worst decision to make because it cost you a million or two million dollars. So you're going to hear contrary things from your staff, and it's okay because they don't see it the same way you, that you do and shouldn't. Uh, decisions are made by council, done by resolution. Uh, resolutions are a one-time decision. Hello. <laughs> Resolutions are a one-time decision on, on fairly basic one-time one -time items. Um, things like bylaws and policies uh, set longer-term direction. <clears throat> the 
excuse me, um, policy making enables those people that you have working for you, or sorry, those in authority council basically to guide the organization in a way that's their view of what's right in those circumstances. Policies enable your staff uh, to respond quickly to issues that come up. So, you know, Gardner Grace comes in the day after a council meeting and has an issue with something. And if you have a policy about it that this is how the city deals with it, staff can deal with it. Otherwise, oh, sorry, Gardner Grace, you know, council just met yesterday and, and it's Christmas, so they're having a holiday, they're not meeting again this month, so you gotta wait like 29 days for council to sit down again. When if the issue is something where the city is always going to deal with it the same way, put it in a policy. Let your staff deal with it. It's good governance. Your pub the public's happier because they get things dealt with much more quickly, and everybody wins. That's good governance. So bylaws, policies, and resolutions are three different levels of decisions. Bylaws require three, I mean, they're all approved by council, but, but um, um, the expectation is that administration is going to comply with council direction. Well, bylaws are the strongest because they have three separate readings, and they're usually long ter longer term decisions. You know, if you're looking at borrowing money, um, there's a whole process to go through. You have to have a hearing, uh, and, and it has to be advertised, and it has to go to the province for, th for approvals, all that kind of stuff. And so bylaws can be very, very long term directions. And so, um, they're the strongest policies, I would say, are intended to be uh, longer term directions as well. And then resolutions are usually one offs. So if you have a bylaw, and I tell this to new councils when I do orientations, is that if you have a bylaw that says, this is how we deal with this, and some issue comes along that go, and you go, oh, this one time we think we should do it this other way instead, even though the bylaw says that we do it that way, you have to change your bylaw. You can't pass a resolution to say, let's disregard this right now and do it this other way instead, just this once. Change your bylaw, because the bylaw is very far reaching. <coughs> Policies are adopted by council. Sometimes the, the, uh, the policy council will be very interested in, this is what we want to see done. And then they may also be interested in, and this is how we want it accomplished, a little bit step by step. Sometimes council is not so concerned about that. That's called procedure. It's the process of how to get from get those things accomplished. So there are times when council will have some procedure in the policy, and there's other times where they go, staff, you figure it out, because you're the experts. You decide how, how to do the procedural part of it to make it happen. Generally, policies outline um, what outcomes council expects, and then the procedure part is the outline of the steps taken to reach that. Uh, the, the City of Winkler has a significant number of policies in place, as well as procedures, and they're all, they all fit together in a nice binder, and they're probably online for the staff to ensure that they know where, what roles they have and expectations and their needs. And one example of a procedure that, that Council may, may not know about at all even, is that you know when taxes are being paid or any other thing are, are being paid to, at the City Hall, um, there's likely a trigger of a dollar limit in cash where it's like, now we're making a deposit because we're not leaving a, that much cash stick sitting around in the, in the building. It's a procedure. Does that hit the council table? I don't know that I've ever seen, seen one of those, but every municipality has that in the office where staff have gone, once we get to this dollar amount, we're doing a deposit, we're taking it to the, to the financial institution so that it's not sitting here. Just makes sense. Okay, so <coughs> I want to chat a little bit about the organization of, of Winkler and how it's set up. Wink the city of Winkler has, has a, what's called an organizational bylaw and it outlines that it has six committees of council. So there's a, 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 a few, few council representatives that sit on those six committees. And so any, any individual council member might sit on two, might sit on one, might sit on three, depending on their availability, uh, time-wise, et cetera. So then issues related to what that committee's, you know, looking after are referred to the committee. The committee will do some homework and have some, um, have some conversation, and then they'll forward what they believe is the right thing to do to council for decision. Non-committee members uh, can attend. The only challenge with having committees 
like this, when you don't have all counsel there, is sometimes the topic is one where everybody wants to have some in input into the conversation. And, and once in a while, those things get repeated at council. The whole conversation gets repeated at the council table. That may not happen very often, and if, if there's a lot of trust between the council members, it likely doesn't happen. But that's the only drawback of this type of format. Some other municipalities have what's called the Committee of the Whole format, where all of council sits at the table and, ha and is involved in those conversations and then refers things to, to a council meeting. The upside is they're all involved in the conversation. The downside is they all have to be there for all of that stuff. And so neither, neither way is wrong. It's, it's preference for the people sitting around the table. Here, they have committees. They have six committees to deal with a lot of that stuff. So what does that all mean as far as time commitments? Well, once you get elected, there's going to be an orientation, probably a day, maybe more. Um, new council at some point is going to commit to some time, might be a couple of days, for st strategic planning to talk about what do we want to accomplish this, this term. And I'm, I'm pretty darn sure that as a newly elected individual, you're going to get a package of material that you're going to need to read through. And I, if, if memory serves me correctly, the last time that there was an orientation package that went out for council in Morden the, for the election, it was about that thick before we went to le electronic. You're going to be reading and reading and reading to get up to speed because October 26th is election, and I'm going to bet you that you've got an, a, a council meeting early in November. And you're going to be expected to be there, and it's going to be live streamed, and people are going to be watching, and, they don't, and, and, and staff do not want you to look foolish. They want you to look professional and intelligent. And in order to do that, you've got to get up to speed, and you've got to get up to speed pretty darn fast. Council meetings, there's two a month normally. Uh, they start at 6.30. They're on the second and fourth Tuesday of the month, adjusted as needed. Um, usually last in the range of 30 minutes to an hour, so they're not terribly long. A lot of the council work is done at those committee levels that I talked about. An agenda package is sent out electronically the Friday before the Tuesday night council meetings. And so your weekends, twice a month, include needing to put some time, set some time aside for reading because you're going to need to be prepared for those council meetings. Committee meetings take place monthly, maybe less frequently, depending on what's going on. Agenda packages are sent out for those also in advance, and so, so there's some more reading that needs to happen. And then I want to chat a little bit about in-camera meetings. So um, in Winkler, like in most places, they're regularly held as part of, of committee meeting, in this case, as part of committee meetings to deal with items that aren't for public information. And those are personal, personnel, legal, pr preliminary negotiation, offers to purchase, that type of thing. So I hear regularly people go, why does council always go in in camera? What are they hiding? Why aren't they, what aren't they telling us? That sort of thing. Well, they're not telling you things that they can't tell you for a very, very valid reason. Personnel is very understandable. But let's talk about, you know, council needs to put in uh, a new new sewer lift station and they need a piece of property that's on a corner somewhere in a portion of Winkler and Gardner Grace has this little old house that she hasn't had her the money to keep up very well and it's getting pretty dilapidated and so that's a pretty darn good location. Why don't we go and talk to Gardner Grace about buying her out because she's ready to go into a senior's facility and, and not be so much a gardener anymore and just be Grace. Grace. So they talk about, well, you know, like it, that's a, such a prime location for us, so you know, what, what would we pay her? They look at the assessment roll and it's got this value. They go, well, let's, let's, let's be a little better than that, so let's offer her this. Yeah, but she's got some kids in town that they're pretty, pretty smart, you know, so maybe, maybe that's not going to cut it. Maybe we need to be prepared to pay more. Well, how much more would we, we be prepared to pay? We would go, well, we pay up to here. Have that conversation in a public meeting that's live streamed. How much do you think you're paying for Gardner Grace's parcel? You're not paying this. You're probably not even paying this because they know that's your kind of your opening point. They're going to go higher. Those kind of conversations have to be in camera. They have to be behind closed doors. Once an agreement is reached, there's a resolution authorizing the signing of the agreement and entering into the purchase. The purchase. Uh, purchase.
purchase agreement for that property. It becomes public. Most of the stuff that is initially dealt with in camera becomes public eventually. But they have to have those conversations behind closed doors because they're a public body and they need to protect you, all of us that live in Winkler, um, for a period of time. It's okay. There's a lot of other council-related things, though. They, um, they have special meetings, not very often, a couple of year, um, not, not terribly long, likely. Uh, they have a financial plan that they adopt every year, a budget, and so there's a review and approval of, of that by council, and it requires multiple meetings. Uh, attendance at meetings with provincial government representatives, once a month, sometimes they're held in Winnipeg. Doesn't mean all of council has to be in, involved in that but there's some members of council that have to take part in those things. Council rep required at official events, and there's multiple events a month that happen. It's not always the mayor that does it. Sometimes that's shared with members of council. And it's just bringing greetings. You know, some hockey age has a provincial tournament. We'd like greetings from the city of Winkler. Someone's gotta go and say, hey, welcome. Hope you enjoy our city, etc." And then there's things like the Association of Manitoba Municipalities. It represents the 137 municipalities in Manitoba. They have a convention every November that's three days long. In, no, in uh, 2022, it's November 21st to 23rd. AMM also has a spring convention that's three days in April, and then they have a June district meeting, which took place yesterday, and Winkler and Stanley actually hosted it. It was at the Winkler Bible Camp. So there's seven days right there. Federation of Canadian Municipalities has a conference in early June. It's four days long. It goes over a weekend, so it's only about two days or three days max, depending on where it is, that, uh, that you, you would be required to take off from work in order to attend that. Head of council gets t is eligible to go every year. Councillors twice during a four-year term. It takes place in different cities across Canada. And then there's the regional stuff. Council members split up representation on a whole bunch of regional organizations like the Winkler Aquifer Management, Winkler and District Health Board, Regional Connections, Pemina Valley Water Co-op, uh, PV Conservation District, Winkler Arts and Culture, and many more. There's a long, long list. Most organizations meet monthly, uh, maybe quarterly. Some meet maybe more frequently with meetings in the morning or evening. And council may meet with neighboring councils as well from time to time, and I know that they do, to discuss common issues. So that's just a bit of the list of time commitments. And from there, really it becomes a matter of how involved you as a member of council want to be or can afford to be time-wise, because sometimes it's, for some people, it's hard to get time off work. Um, if you end up chairing one of those organizations as the council rep, that's more time, because now you're doing signing authority and signing checks or whatever, right? So it takes more time. So. I would, I would be surprised if the current members of council aren't spending a minimum of 20 hours a month being a councillor. And there are ones that are probably spending a lot more than that. That would, be, that would be a real minimum. So for anybody that's heard from their friends saying, you should run for council, it's only two meetings a month, not quite. It's a little bit more. And that doesn't include the reading time. Like there's a, there is a ton of stuff that you do. It's a lot of work but it also, is, to me, is one of the most fulfilling things that you can do for, for your community. So, those decisions, someone writes and requests something, it, uh, the way that you should expect that it happens is it's forwarded to the department that's responsible for the issue. They prepare a report with all that information I talked about, goes through the CAO to, to, uh, for review, and then it goes either to committee or to council. Council then looks at it, and, and uh, if it's something that happens time and time and time again, There'll even be a recommendation. Let's just make this a policy so the council doesn't have to worry about it every, every, every time it comes up. Eventually, there's a rec that recommendation hits the council table and there's a resolution that's either exactly like that or maybe a little bit different, but somewhere along the line then it gets dealt with and then staff look, out, look after it. Administration looks after that day-to-day -day thing. Um, where a department head might not be sure of how something should be done, they're going to talk to the CAO. If they think that maybe there's an issue with a current policy, it's going to come back to council and, and you're going to hear from your staff to say, you know, the count, that policy you had, it worked well for a while. It's starting to cause some problems because the world has changed. Things have changed. We probably need to, to relook at that thing. And that's regularly that that takes place. Um, <coughs> Even residents, you know, they may write and say, I got issue with the policy, and they, uh, 
they absolutely have the right to do that. And council may say we're good with it. They may say we want to change it. But if you get two or three people saying we got issues and council's like, we're not changing the policy, don't be surprised that your staff, the fourth person that writes, they just write back and say, council's reviewed this a, a couple of times very recently and are satisfied that it's, it, the policy is sound. We'll not be making adjustments. You'll still hear from, from your staff that they sent that letter. But they're looking after you. So now, the money. What do you get to paid for all of the, that time? Uh, one counselor from Morgan said it works out to 25 cents an hour, Ernie, whatever the amount is. In Winkler right now, head of council gets just over, well, almost $37,500 for the year. Deputy mayor is just over 20000 and then counsel other councillors are just over $17,000 for the year. Daily, <coughs> excuse me, daily indemnity for attending conferences, uh, even something like going to that one-day June district meeting that happened at Winkler Bible Camp yesterday. Uh, it's $20, $250 for a full day or $125 for a half day. Travel allowance is based on National Joint Council, which is reviewed quarterly. It's going to be updated ju uh, July 1st, so that $0.52 cents will probably hit $0.55. Cents. And then meals and hotels are reimbursed based on a reasonable dollar amount. So typically, council members are not out of pocket for when they attend things. Unless you're a very well-paid professional or you own a business and you got to pay somebody more than the $250 you might get to look after your business while you're go gone to a conference. All of these dollars are, uh, sorry, the indemnities are taxable. The uh, reimbursement of expenses are not, but it's taxable income. I think that's it. So, in summary, I want to say that uh, um, I mean, I, I I share some of those things that are really important for you to know because they can they can cause some, some pretty big stumbling pretty quick. I hope that that hasn't though uh, um, made you think, oh, gee, I don't want to run because. It is, and I, I've talked to lots of council individuals who have been on council, whether it's for one term or seven terms, who say, you know, it's one of the best things they've ever done because they just have been so fulfilled by, by doing things for their community. And yeah, the last four years has been a bit of a challenge, whether you've been on council or, or other things with all this COVID stuff, right? And there are some people that have been on councils across the province who have said, yeah, I'm done. That just finished me off. I've had enough. But ho hopefully we're past that and we get to get to go back to doing great things and, and wondering how we can make the place, the place that we live a better place and worrying about that kind of stuff. So if you are looking at running, I commend you and I wish you all the best because every community needs volunteers willing to step forward. Yeah, you're getting paid, but you're not getting paid a lot once you figure out the hours. And, and I, I worry for places, I did a presentation like this at a municipality last week. That's how many non-current non elected count members of council showed up for it. They advertised like crazy. They got nobody. Like we talked about how do we get pu public interest to run for council? And I think social media has been a, been a, a disservice for for a lot of a, a lot of situations, because people get to hide behind aliases and just sh you know poke at council members. And I would encourage anybody that if you have an issue with something a council's doing, go speak to them directly if you're not happy with it. If you want to praise them, do that publicly. But they deserve your respect too, you know. So I hope that if you run and you get elected, that you're able to encourage people to pr to show show that respect to you as well and. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're human. We may make, mix, make mistakes even as members of council. The only way we can become better is to get that feedback from the people that we, we serve and represent. So. There's a great book that the province puts out that's a 2022 Candidates Guidebook. If you, if you Google um, Manitoba Candidates Guidebook, it'll pop up. You can download it. It's a really good read. I would encourage you to, uh, to look at that. Uh, there are people who would suggest that being on council is a thankless job. I think, I think for, for almost all individuals that have been on council, it has been a very rewarding experience for them. And I would very much encourage anybody that's thinking about it to do your homework, make sure it's the thing you want to do, make sure you understand what the role is, and then get your, get your papers in and, and run. I admire you if you are prepared
prepared to let your name stand. That's the presentation. Um, hey, look at that. Hour and 35 minutes, like I said. So, um, I, if, if somebody has any questions or you want to have a conversation on some things, by all means, I'd be happy to do that. Or we can drink coffee and eat cookies. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll do as much as they can to set it up so that they don't have to be involved in a lot of things and they're just, you know, looking big picture. We even, <coughs> excuse me, in Morden, you know, there's all these, these organizations in, in, in town that, that uh, you know, expect a council representative one. Art gallery, museum, um, chamber of commerce, you know, a whole bunch of things, right? And we had a conversation one after one election and I said, you know, council members that are returning, didn't you find it challenging that you're at the, at the art gallery meeting and they go, yeah, we'd really like to do this, but we need $10,000. And then they go, think you could get that from council? And so you have to take off your, your art gallery hat and put your council hat on and go, you know, that's a really good cause. I'll go and, I'll go and see what I can do. And then you go to the council meeting, it's on the agenda, and the, 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 that item finally comes up and you're wearing your councillor hat, but what do you do? take off your counselor hat and you put on your art gallery hat and going, art gallery needs this $10,000 and I'm prepared to make a motion that we, we give it to them. Aren't you a, like a little bit like a gopher for the organization? And isn't it hard to represent council if you're wearing the art gallery hat? You know, so council talked about that in Morden and they actually got off all of those organizations and they said, we appreciate you, we're thrilled with all the things you do for this community. If you need support and help from us, come see us. We're not going to have a rep on there anymore. And part of the philosophy was that was uh, the philosophy of that was some individuals can't put in that amount of time to be on council to deal with all this council stuff, and then all of these organizations that council doesn't really have to be a member have a member on. So they pulled out of those things to focus on the on the council stuff and reduce the workload. to make this widget and is there ways that we can reduce the amount of steps so that it becomes much more streamlined, it saves time and, and cost and, and we do it better. And you know, that's the quick philosophy of that. And, and, and uh, so AMM has, has uh, on their website has best practices for municipalities. Manitoba Municipal Administrators Association for the CAOs has best practices. They have a uh, MMAA for the mem those who are members, you can put out a you can put a question up that's sent.
sent out to all the other members, like, I'm dealing with this. Has anybody dealt with it? And have you got some ideas of how I might deal, you know, look, how much, what I, advice I might give, whatever. So, yeah. starts to lose its prettiness on, on uh, live streaming after a while. So if, if they're, you know, if I'm not talking, it's just like, uh, actually, this is my good side. So. <laughs> Any other questions? None. The ability to get elected. That's the only ability a council member needs, technically. Um, that said, uh, would I, would I, wow, that's, you know, what would be the, the key things that I, that I would, I would appreciate for a council member is someone, and I'm going to use the example, uh, City of Brandon asked, asked me to facilitate their strategic planning, which I did. I was kind of like, well, that's a pretty big place. And they said, nope, we want to we want to get a proposal from you, and I ended up doing it. They have a council of 11, and they had their, their management team there. So there's about 20 people in the room. And we spent a day and a half, and, and the city of Brandon is large enough, you, you're starting to see the, the, uh, the party politics, NDP, PC stuff, and they have it all on council. A very, very diverse group. And after that day and a half was over, I, I specifically said to them, I am so impressed with you as a group that, you know, while we were discussing what's the, what's the strategies that we want to do this term, there was lots of different viewpoints. And all of you made sure not only, not only did you listen to the others that you probably didn't agree with, but you asked questions to make sure you understood what they were trying, the point they were trying to make, so that you could, you know, consider that, and then as a group you, you worked on what was in the best, you know, what was best for, for the community. And, and I said, I am so appreciative of a group that's able to do that. And they all, they all as like the, the ele 10 council members, all pointed to the mayor and said it's because of him, and the mayor went no 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 no. And they said yes it is, and it's they, you know he worked, he he's one of those natural leaders that that sat down with them individually after election and we're gonna we're gonna have differences, we're not always gonna agree. We need to figure out a way that we're gonna work together, and respect each other, and 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 hear each other, not just listen but hear, and make sure you understand. So that, because sometimes that other person's going to be smarter than you and have the right the right way to do it, that staff haven't figured out, that you might not have thought of, and you go, wow, you know, because I've seen lots of that where it's like, man, I wish I would have thought of that when I go and work in other municipalities. Because I still learn stuff every day, but it's 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 listening to the others, and and new council members should probably do a lot more listening than talking, because the ones that are returning have a lot of knowledge and experience to share, as do staff. Doesn't mean you don't get to have your 14 point, what did I say, 285% uh, decision making. Just, but being, being part of, being very keen on getting it right and, and letting it go. You don't win, win the vote, let it go. It's over. This is democracy. Majority won. Majority rules. That's the way it works. That to me is the, the biggest thing to help field to right field with way different viewpoints. They got along. Amazing. Amazing. 
council, a councillor for a period of time before you run for mayor. A person can come in and run for mayor. Um, I have seen individuals who have been council members for, for um, a long time who have gotten in as the head of council, and I'm not talking about Winkler, have gone in, gotten in as the head of council, and, and it hasn't worked. Because they're not, they're not leadership quality people. Yeah. It never hurts. Yeah, I, I mean, board experience is, is beneficial. Bad board experience is not, <laughs> right? So, so you know, people who have who uh, have been on council and, and and then as councilors and then run for head of council, certainly have have um, ha have some advantage to that position. Um, you know, I think of John Weintz was the mayor in Morden at one time. Well, he was he was the chair of uh, one of the credit unions in Winnipeg for for a number of years, and so. You know, he had that kind of level of board chair service that he had done, and, and that helped. But he still had lots to learn. You know, somebody who's been on council and knows the ins and outs of councils can hit the ground running a little more as a, as a mayor. But someone who has no experience, who's just a, one of those true natural leaders and can just make it work, that, that can also work. It doesn't exclude people, but makes it harder if you haven't been on council, I would say. Okay. Well, if there aren't any more questions, then I will wrap this up and say thanks very much for attending. I, it's great to see that there's a, a number of people who are thinking about running. Whether or not you do is up to you, but the fact that you're thinking about it is great.